I got you guys. I wasn't saying anything. Sorry. Coffee breath. I wasn't even saying a word. Uh, I got you guys. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, because I just drank coffee, you can see my coffee uh, stained teeth. Okay. Yeah. Okay, folks, how you doing? We're going to begin. We'll just wait a few more minutes, wait for the regulars to show up. And for the glory of the Father, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the glory of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll see the numbers increase who love Jesus Christ want to learn. Right? So you got you see, I got a Marvel shirt today, right? Good to see some of you. I'm now corrected, connected directly to the modem, the router, and I'm not using internet. So hopefully the buffering will go away in Jesus' name by the power of Jesus Christ, no more buffering. It's been phenomenal, right? Now, I don't know if it's a new shirt, Mike. How do you know I haven't had it in my closet and I decided to wear it now? Yeah, I wanted to begin by saying some things. Uh, yesterday, I felt the need, almost like compelled, to say, <clears throat> to make a specific point in Jesus' name as the Holy Spirit takes over my mouth and cleanses my mouth and my heart, my soul, my entire being in the holy blood of our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, enables me to speak clearly and truthfully and accurately without standing. Please, Holy Spirit, we are in love with you. We need you. We need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. We'll begin. So I'm going to say something, but... One of the things I hate with a passion, let me just tell you something. I hate with a passion. See, I told you, it's going to buffer a little bit, but we're close to the modem. Yeah, please, Father, please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit. Right? It's going to get better. Right? Guys, don't panic. It's going to buffer. It's going to buffer. But I'm connected to the modem, so it's much better than it was. Hopefully it gets stronger and better by the grace of our trying God, Father, Holy Spirit. Let me share some with you guys. I cannot stand, I cannot stand when I make a mistake, when I misspeak, when I'm in error. I cannot stand it. I don't know if it's because of my pride, my arrogance, because I always want to be right. May the Father crucify my flesh in Jesus' name. The Lord Jesus purify me, cleanse me in his precious blood, and the Holy Spirit sanctify me to become more like Jesus Christ. So guess what? Thanks to this precious brother, thanks to this precious brother, Joel Glenn Davis. The Lord Jesus bless you, brother. He caught it, and I'm, I'm sad that most of you didn't catch it. Yesterday, it's not so much that I don't know what the terms meant, but I guess as I was speaking fast, and in my mind, I thought I was articulating the point clearly. It came out wrong. So I went back and I saw around the 21-minute mark, I was explaining the word Tanakh. Do you remember? So glory to Jesus Christ. People come back. We'll listen from the beginning. We'll hear this correction. Irata. Correct what I said yesterday. Remember yesterday I said that Jews who don't believe in Jesus Christ, whether religious Jews or even agnostic or atheist Jews, do not like to call the Old Testament the Old Testament. <clears throat> they call it the Hebrew Bible or they'll call it the Tanakh. And I said that the Tanakh is an acronym because it combines the letters for the threefold classification of the Hebrew Bible. The way the Jews have divided the Hebrew Bible, they've divided it into three sections, threefold classification. You have the Torah, the instructions given by God to and through Moses. You have the what's known as the Nevi'im, Nevi'im or Nebi'im, Nebi'im. Nevi'im, and then you have the Ketuvim, Ketuvim, okay. For some reason, I don't know why, I mistakenly said that the word Ketuvim, Ketuvim, refers to the prophetic books. No. The word Ketuvim means writings. The word Ketuvim, Ketuvim, it's just like if you speak Arabic. If you guys speak Arabic, the Arabic word for writing or book is kitab. Kitab. Because Arabic, Aramaic, Syriac, and Hebrew are cognate languages. They are sister languages. So the ketuvim is the term that refers to that section 
of the Hebrew Bible. I hope I did Abdul Hadij. I, I didn't watch all of it. <clears throat> the Ketuvim is the term that refers to that section of the Hebrew Bible <clears throat> where you find the wisdom books, the wisdom literature, Psalms, Proverbs, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, as well as the book of Daniel and Chronicles. Now, I don't, don't ask me why Daniel is listed. Daniel's listed in the Ketuvim, Ketuvim, right? I don't know why. I know there are scholars there that may know why, right? Yeah, Job as well. That's the wisdom literature, Benjamin. I don't have to mention every book listed in that category, right? But Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> Song of Psalms. Yeah, I'm real close to this. All right, I guess I got to move closer. Sorry about that. Guys, don't panic. Don't panic. It's going to buffer. The connection is 99% better than it was. It doesn't buffer as much or as long. And in Jesus' name, it's going to be perfected by the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. So I got closer to the modem. Don't panic, guys. Come on. When you panic and you say it's buffering, then my flesh kicks in, and then I get angry and rage, and I want to sin and smash something. Either smash my teeth, smash my head, smash the computer, beat someone's face in. Right? May, may the Lord Jesus crucify my flesh, destroy my flesh, and save me from my flesh by the power and the life of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Yeah, I mean, I, my anger, bro. Whew. And I'm not a tough guy. That's the problem. I'm not in fighting shape. I, I have anger issues that I can't fight because I'm not in fighting shape. Before, when I used to kickbox and I was, you know, muscular, then I could hold my own. Right now, it's the 10-second rule, Mike. It's a 10-second rule. If I get angry, I better knock you out in 10 seconds or there I go. There goes my buddy ALD. Sorry, brother. I forgot. I knew I forgot to text you that we're going live. But glory to Jesus Christ, you found us. Yeah, it's called the 10-second rule. If I can't beat you up in 10 seconds, I'm done. You, you'll you just you know have a feel. It's all right because I'll be so out of breath. <sighs> go ahead, man. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, I deserve it. So until I get in fighting shape, I can't fight. And yet the problem is I can't control my anger. So my trust is the Holy Spirit will constrain me and give me the grace to be in control and exercise complete self-restraint by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Right? But anyway, coming back to the issue. The word ketuvim means the writings. Now, here's what's interesting. Benjamin mentioned, isn't Job listed in that category, in that classification? Yes, it is. But the ketuvim doesn't begin with Job like our Old Testament does. That section, you have Job in the Christian classification of the Old Testament. You have Job first, then Psalms, then Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes, and then the Song of Solomon, right? Not in the Hebrew Bible copied and or translated by Jews. In that section, the Ketuvim, it starts with the Psalms, okay? And you know what the last book of the Hebrew Bible, the last book of the Hebrew Bible copied by Jews and or translated by Jews into English, what, what the last book of the Hebrew Bible happens to be? What's the last Old Testament book in the Christian Bible? When you get to the end of the Old Testament in the Christian Bible, you know, the Christian Old Testament copied and or translated by Christians. What's the last? What's the last book? Malachi. In the Hebrew Bible, copied and or translated by Jews, it's Chronicles. Their Bible ends with Chronicles. Okay. So to correct myself, Irada, glory to Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer. And I thank the Lord Jesus for brothers and sisters who catch me in my stakes, mistakes, let me know because by the grace of God's spirit, I pray I'm always humble enough to then correct it because I don't want to give you misinformation. And I hate when I'm wrong. I can't stand it. I get angry. I've been angry all day. I was angry that I made that mistake, even though to some people it's minor. That just tells you I got serious mental issues. That's something that minor, it kills me. And then secondly, Amazon dropped the ball. I was supposed to get some books for my library for research and they didn't put the apartment number, so I had to 
go to the United Postal Service and they told me the books were taken back to the Amazon Fulfillment Center. So I had to drive another 40 minutes to find it and they didn't let me in because it's only for employees. And then I had to call Amazon and they canceled my order and I have to reorder it. And I'm really feeling so angry and sad. I just want to end my life by buying <clears throat> deep dish sausage pizza and a pint of ice cream and stuffing myself until I choke and I die <clears throat> from overeating. Okay. So glory to Jesus Christ. He preserved me and the Holy Spirit is filling me with love and joy and peace and contentment to trust in him and to and <clears throat> just hand everything over to him. My life is his and he'll preserve me for the glory of Jesus. But because, man, I had a bad day today. Now, that's the word ketuvim. The other word, neviim, neviim or nebiim. That's the word for prophets. So you have in the Jewish classification of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, that's the five books of Moses, Nevi'im, Nevi'im, those are the prophetic books like Isaiah and Jeremiah. And then you have the Ketuvim, what we call the wisdom books. But also part of that is Daniel and Chronicles. And if you go to Chabad.org, you'll see that classification for yourself. So, Joey, Lord Jesus, bless you and thank you for being used of the Spirit to catch you in my error so I could correct myself and may the Holy Spirit save me from further error in Jesus' name. All right? So let's pray. And then I need to share something with you because I felt it last night and I feel compelled to repeat it so we can go into the meat of the matter. Father, we love you, though we love you imperfectly, unfortunately to our shame, and we fail you. And Father, we do struggle with our flesh, our flesh that's been tainted, that's been corrupted and polluted by sin. And we ask your grace and your mercy and your compassion that you wash us, purify us, and cleanse us in the holy, pure blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Your heart, your love, your Son that became flesh and crucify our flesh. Deliver us from our flesh and transform us by the life and power of your holy, glorious, beautiful, majestic spirit. Please, Father, by your spirit, save us from our flesh. Heal us, Father. Heal me, Father, because we are damaged. <clears throat> and we need healing, Father. I know I do. I need the blood of Jesus to cleanse me and wash me and heal me. We all do. And let the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse our children, our loved ones, my daughters, and purify them and shield them. That the blood of Jesus will shield them from irreparable damage. And the Holy Spirit will just flood them in your presence and your love. And not just our, our loved ones, not just my daughters, but ourselves, Father, because we need that healing, Lord. And please save us from our flesh and transform us and heal us by the stripes of Jesus, by the wounds of Jesus, by the blood of the cross of Jesus. We are made whole. Make us whole more and more until we are completely whole. Either when we enter your presence or Jesus comes down and transforms us, Father. But we need it, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Heal us spiritually, Lord. Heal us mentally, Lord. Heal us psychologically. Heal us emotionally. Heal us physically because we're all damaged in all those areas. And you are Yahovah Rapha, Jehovah the healer who heals. And we trust in you, Father. We trust in you, Lord Jesus. We trust in you, Holy Spirit. Anoint my mouth to speak truth without error, without confusion, without stammering. And bless them, Father, with wisdom from your spirit, with knowledge from your spirit, with understanding and power from your Holy Spirit. And make the sound of my voice pleasing to their ears and save us from distractions, Father. Bless the internet connection, Father. And use these sessions and these articles for the glory of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that more people will listen and more people will read and disseminate this if it's truthful and faithful to scriptures. And that's what I ask for, Father, that Jesus Christ increases in us and that we decrease. And Christ sits enthroned upon our hearts, upon the hearts of our loved ones, upon the hearts of my daughters, Father. Please, Father, please, Abba, please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, have your way. Bless this session and guide me for the glory of Jesus. Bless them, Father, to understand. And that through these sessions, your spirit will make them fall more in love with Jesus, stand more in awe of Jesus, and cleave to Jesus more desperately. And not just them, but me, Father. We truly need you, Lord. We are truly broken. 
because of the fall of Adam and Eve, because of Satan and his rebellion. We live in a broken world. We are broken, but you are our healer, our creator, our maker, our life, our savior. So we trust in you and we need you. We love you, Bobby. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Watch this among you. God bless everything, Lord Jesus Christ. Yahweh, bless you. Hey, Scott, brother, I will call you later. Scott, my brother from a different mother, I will call you later, brother. Don't think I'm ignoring you. You, you see why I couldn't pick up your call. I've been running around trying to find these packages. Man, was I angry. Okay, with that said, praise God for the mods, for helping me to help you. And Protestant had to step away for a while, so we got first and the last, and he's going to be posting Bible verses. But yesterday, I just felt the need to share this again. And today, I feel even more compelled to share it. And guys, I don't want to constantly share it because I don't want people to think. Because again, let's be honest. You got people like Hater Wood. Speaking of the devil, he just showed up. You got people like Hater Wood who will always accuse your motives and assume that you're doing things for ulterior motives. Because you know what? To the pure, all things are pure. But to David Wood, nothing is pure. Now, anyway, we will ignore him. We will love him for the sake of Jesus. We'll pray God's richest blessings on him. You know, because he's in this world to teach us patience, teach us self-control. Because if there's any man that will test your patience, it's this man. So he serves the purpose to show us we are where we are weak and imperfect and why we need endurance to overcome. Now, if you can handle him, you know you are really close to glory. All right. With that said. Again, my prayer is truly that the Holy Spirit will always sanctify my heart, purify my motives, to never prostitute myself for fame or money. Never. Please, Lord Jesus, say me that. So, again, I want to share this. And I know those, my detractors, say, ah, yeah, he's just putting on a show. No, no. You know, he's just trying to be humble. No, no. I'm trying to be honest. And I feel the need, right? I feel the need to share this. Okay. We human beings, whether we like it or not, we are idol makers, idol factories. Our hearts tend to idolatry because being in the image of God, though tainted by sin, we are created with the need to worship. We are created with the need to be in love with someone and to imitate someone and to worship someone. God created us to be in love with him to follow him, to imitate him and worship him. But because of the fall, because of our sinful nature, that sinful inclination that's attached to our flesh, that the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us from and saving us from until that sinful nature, that sinful inclination is completely eradicated by the grace of Jesus Christ. Because of sin and because of Satan, we choose to find someone or something other than the true God to worship imitate and be in love with right that's part of the fall now in christianity and it's i want to share this again and i hope i don't have to repeat it because i think i really from my heart i felt the need i need to share this again in christianity we who are born of the spirit we are now at war with the flesh and write this down we're not going to quote this write this down pay attention please Write this down. Read it tonight at your own leisure. Meditate upon this section of Scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to empower you more and more. The more you yield to the Holy Spirit, the more you let the Holy Spirit fill you, the more powerful you'll become over your flesh and the desires of your flesh to crucify and conquer your flesh. But you have to yield to the Spirit more and more and walk in union with the Spirit and do what the Spirit says by His grace and power. Now, with that said, write down Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26. It's all there, Mike. It's in Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26. It says, now that you're born of the Spirit, you're no longer a prisoner to sin. You're no longer taken captive by sin. You've been set freed by the Spirit. So now you are at war with your sinful inclination, your sinful nature, sin that now resides in your flesh. Now you're at war with it. So write down Galatians 5, 16 to 26. Okay, write that down. And then cross-reference that with Romans 7, verses 7 to 25. Write these down because we're not going to read them tonight or today. So for some of you, it's night. 
Romans 7, verses 7 to 25. So Galatians 5, 16 to 26. Romans 7, verses 7 to 25. And Romans chapter 8, verses 1. Yeah, well, Romans 8, verses 1. Well, read the entire chapter. Romans 8, verses 1 to 39. All of that chapter. Now, now that you're born of, are born of the Spirit, sin no longer enslaves you, controls you, and you're no longer powerless against sin. Now you have the freedom to war against your sinful inclination and desires because you have the Spirit of the living God in you to empower you. But the Holy Spirit also expects you to walk in co cooperation with the Spirit. So the more I cooperate with the Spirit, the more I yield to the Spirit, the stronger I become to conquer my sinful inclinations. Everyone with me there? You understand what I'm saying? I just want it to sink in. Because we still have sinful inclination that we're warring against, that sinful inclination tries to get us to continue <clears throat> idolizing individuals or things contrary to God's will. This is why you'll find in Christianity... Christian brothers and sisters that make their heroes in the faith, Bible teachers that they listen to, or apologists that they're in awe of, more than they are, and then they end up idolizing them so that they can do no wrong. So if you criticize any one of them, they react and attack you because they've turned these men and women of God, instruments in the hands of the Holy Spirit, into idols that can say nothing wrong. Are you with me there? You understand? Is it sinking in? For example, anytime I will criticize, let's say Mike Heiser, and I say he's a great man of God, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's wrong here. Those who have now turned him into an idol and made him more than he is get angry and try to attack or will criticize me and talk behind my back. Or anytime I say, my precious brother, my dear brother, whom I love from my heart. I do love this man. We've had our differences, but God has healed us of that rift and reconciled us. If I say, well, James White is wrong here. Those who have made James White more than he is, right, will attack me, criticize me, and try to discredit me behind my back. Now, let me repeat for the record. Michael Heiser is a great man of God. He is. He's brilliant. I'm not on his level, and I say this with sincerity. James White, I love him. He was one of the men that the Lord Jesus used in my life early in my apologetics ministry. Okay, These are great men of God. David Wood, as much as we banter back and forth, a soldier, a warrior for Jesus Christ. Okay, Christian Prince, an amazing terror against Islam. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. You have people who listen to them, who've made them more than they are, turned them into titles so that they can do no wrong, and that is sin. So I feel compelled to tell you, and I know you are smarter than that and better than that. One thing I ask, please ask the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, there's a lot of things I want you to ask the Holy Spirit for, but two main things. Please, Spirit, to never let you make me more than I am. Okay, sorry, see, it's buffering. In Jesus' name, rebuke the buffering. See, it buffer right at the point I was trying to make. God bless you, Zoe, and bless your parents, soldiers of the living God, the triumph God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay? God bless you, Zoe, and your parents, soldiers of the living God, the triumph God. Okay, let me, let me share it again. Okay, listen to me. Listen. Please ask the Holy Spirit to guard your heart to never make me more than I am. Say, Holy Spirit. He's a human vessel, tainted, fallen, imperfect, affected by sin, and he has issues. Guard my heart not to make him more than he is. And I'm not saying you are, but I just feel the need to ask you to do this. Don't make me more than I am. And pray in Jesus' name, the Lord Jesus, save me from my own flesh from arrogance and pride and haughtiness because I am not better than these men and women of God who have fallen and have disgraced the name of Jesus. I am human like them, prone to the same sinful 
temptations they are. So ask the Holy Spirit to keep me humble and teachable and to never be puffed up and see me for what I am. I have to say this. I really feel the need to say it. See me for what I am. I am a broken vessel. We all are. I have been tainted by the fall of Adam and Eve and the sin in the world, tainted by my own sinful inclinations, raised in a broken home, <clears throat> gone through broken relationships that have damaged me, and only Jesus can heal me, and I know he will heal me because he has promised to heal all of us, but in his time, and he heals us daily until we're completely whole by his grace and mercy. But until then, I have anger issues. I have patience issues. I'm impatient. I struggle with carnal desires. <clears throat> I'm often rude. I can be disrespectful. And I can talk down to people. And I also have low self-esteem. Right? Right? <clears throat> And I struggle with loneliness. So I am a broken vessel. Please don't make me more than I am. See me for who I am. A sinner like all of us. Who is your brother in Christ, born of the Spirit. Who, like all of us, needs Jesus to save him from his own flesh. And empower him by the Spirit to become more like Jesus. And less like myself in the world. So that when you don't make me more than I am and see me for who I really am, if I do offend you, and I've offended many of you, and forgive me for that, you won't lose hope, your heart won't be broken, and <clears throat> you won't lose faith. Because when you make these men and women of God more than they are, when they fall, then your whole hope and faith can be shattered, and your heart is broken, and you can lose faith in Christ. So please... Please don't make any human teacher more than they are. Don't look to them and make them more than they are. This is one of the reasons why in the Word of God, the Holy Bible, and I need you to listen to this. Why do you think in the wisdom of God, in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, right? In the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, God records the moral failures of his prophets, his apostles, and his servants. Why do you think God records that David committed adultery and murdered the husband to cover up his sin and shame? Why do you think God records that Solomon married 700 women, foreign women, and 300 concubines and started worshiping their gods and goddesses? Why do you think God records that Samson went to Gaza and slept with a whore, a prostitute? Why do you think God in Genesis 38 records Judah, Judah, finding what he thought was a whore, a prostitute, and slept with her and got her pregnant, and unbeknownst to him, that was his daughter-in-law, Tamar? Why do you think God has Paul record in Galatians 2, his condemnation and rebuke of Peter for acting the hypocrite. And why do you think in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, and Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9, there the Holy Spirit has John record his momentary lapse into idolatry where he fell before that angel not once but twice to worship him because he was so awed by his luminous presence that the angel twice had to rebuke him and say, don't worship me. I'm a fellow slave like you and with your brothers, the prophets, worship God. Why do you think God did that? Why do you think God recorded all these moral failures of the mighty men and women of God? Some of whom gave us God-breathed scriptures. And why do you think of all the human beings mentioned, only one human being stands out as being completely perfect, pure, sinless, spotless, Jesus Christ? Because Jesus is not just human. He's more than human. He's God Almighty in the flesh. So, folks, I felt really 
I felt yesterday and today was confirmed that I had to repeat this. Okay? I had to repeat this. Do not idolize us. And I'm not saying you idolize me. But in case, I know you'll be in awe of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as they're displayed through human vessels. But don't look to the person, the human person. Look to the giver. The reason why this knowledge and wisdom that I'm sharing with you, I'm able to, is because of the giver. Be in awe, be in love with the giver of this wisdom and knowledge and all these good gifts. So anything I say that blows your mind, anything I say that convicts you, anything I say that moves you to tears and fall in love with Jesus, it's not me. It's him, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Look to the giver and fall in love with him and thank the giver for using sinners like me because that means he can use you for his glory and then say, Lord, preserve that human instrument, that sinner, so he will not fall because only God will not fall and fail you, but we will. You understand now? I just had, I needed to share that with you guys. I really felt compelled to share that with you guys. Yeah. Right? Everyone clear now? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6, to see what Paul says. Now, uh, first last, quote, quote in the King James, but also quote it in the NIV. Leather jacket, let me be honest with you before the Lord. I do this for myself, to rebuke myself, and to check myself. Because I fear, because I know my flesh and my sins, and I can fall and bring great shame to Jesus. So I fear for that, and I beg Jesus, please, Lord, don't hand me over and give me what I deserve. Give me your love and grace and preserve me because I cannot do it. And I mean that, leather jacket. It's from my heart. I'm not lying to you. Now, let's see what Paul says. Sin is to break the revealed law of God in the scriptures, Ty. Don't ask me these questions. If you're not asking sincerely, you will be blocked. Guys, let's read 2 Corinthians 12, 6. Here, read what Paul says. Okay. For though I would desire to glory, though I would desire to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear. I delay that. I delay boasting. Why? lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me. The reason why I wanted the NIV so it can be a little more plain English, 2 Corinthians 12, 6. Now read, look what Paul is saying. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth, but I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Did you catch it? Paul says, I do not want any of you to make me more than I am. I do not want any of you to make me more than I am. And Paul was a spirit-filled apostle and soldier of Jesus who did miracles, who gave us half the New Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and died as a martyr. None of us can hold the candlestick to Paul. And if Paul is saying, don't make me more than I am, you better believe you don't make any of us more than we are. You with me there? Clear? Thank the Lord. I just had to share this. I, I, was, I was feeling yesterday I had to share this. And I want to just share it. Guys, you do not know how much dependent I am on your prayers and on your fasting for my children and I. Because we are members of the spiritual body of Christ, and God designed it that we need one another, right? The only one who doesn't need us is God. But God designed it that we all are interdependent as we're co connected to the head, Jesus. Jesus is the one who supplies all the members of his body with all their gifts. So he gives you gifts that I need because he didn't give me those gifts. And he's given me gifts that you need because he didn't give it to you to teach us you need one another. And ultimately, all of you need me because I'm the one who supplies all your needs and gifts. So I'm in need of your prayers. My daughters are in need of your prayers and your fasting. And whatever gift God has given you that I don't have, I need your gift. 
to be used by the Spirit to bless me so I can then achieve the goal of becoming more like Jesus. Okay, I hope that's clear. With that said, let's talk about foreshadows of Christ in the Hebrew Scriptures. Is that clear? Foreshadows of Christ in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, let me explain what I mean by foreshadows of Christ. You, you know I'm going to have to do more than one part, right? You know how that works. There's so much meat in the Bible, I won't be able to finish it in one session. Right? So what do I mean? Let's go to Zechariah 3, verse 8 to 9. And again, we're going to stick with the King James for the most part, but sometimes I may switch to a translation that's in a little clearer English for those whose, whose mother tongue is in English and may not understand. Zechariah 3, verses 8 to 9. All right. And then we'll look at Zechariah 3, 8 in the King James. Now, guys, read with me. Guys, now here's where I need you to pay attention. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to help me. To focus now. Drawing what, medic? If you're drawing for school or something, that's fine, as long as you can focus and learn. But if you're drawing and it's going to distract you, then you're only robbing yourself. Okay, no, the King James first, uh, first last. Just follow with me. Okay, guys, let's read. Let's read, guys. Okay. Here now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. See, this is why I was going to say we're going to look at another translation. Because many people don't understand what that phrase means. For they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I've laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith Jehovah of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Now let's again look at Zechariah 3 verse 8, NIV, or ESV. Because here is where I'm going to now. Now, many of you know this. I've done many sessions. I have many articles on this method of finding Jesus in the Hebrew Bible. So for many of you, I'm preaching to the choir. But thank you for still joining and <clears throat> being patient to hear something you already know. Because we want to benefit everyone, even the new people, right? We're hearing this for the first time. Okay, Zechariah 3, 8. ESV, hear now, O Joshua, thy priests and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. They are a sign. Behold, I'll bring my servant the branch. Here is the principle of shadows and realities, types, prototypes, right? <clears throat> Confirmed in Zechariah 3, verse 8. Notice what God tells Zechariah. Here I need you guys to pay attention. If I'm confusing you, let me know. And guys, hit that like button. Right. OK. God tells Zechariah, do you see Joshua, the high priest? You see Joshua, the high priest? Do you see the men working with Joshua, serving with Joshua? They are all a sign, a sign of something greater, of someone to come. They're all a sign of my servant, the branch. Did you catch that? Before I move on, if you're not getting it, then we won't be able to proceed to the next point. Did you catch it? They are all a sign pointing to a greater reality, someone to come. And that someone is my servant, the branch. The Hebrew word is simach, simach. There's another word for branch used in Isaiah 11, and that's natsir, notsir, notsir. Okay. My servant, the branch, Simach. In Isaiah 11, 1, it's Notzer. That's a different one. Okay, now, what did you learn here? God in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, has shown us that many of these individuals, many of these events are deliberately designed to be a sign of something to come in the future. Are you catching that <clears throat> right there? Are you seeing this principle that historical events and historical persons that are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, their lives and their experiences were guided by God in such a way to point to something greater, to something else in the future. They are signs of something to come. Do you see right there? Let someone say, I'm using the New Testament. No, here the Hebrew Bible. Zechariah 3.8. The Hebrew Bible. Zechariah, Joshua the high priest. And the men serving with him, 
They are all a sign of my servant, the branch. Simach. What do you mean you can't see it, Tafsa? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Didn't you read Zechariah 3, verse 8? Hey, yes, Allah, Allahu Akbar. Let's try this again. Let's post it again for her. Hear now, O Joshua, thy priest. So Zechariah is speaking through, I'm sorry, Jehovah is speaking through Zechariah. Jehovah is announcing Zechariah, and through Zechariah, tell Zechariah this. He is going to be a sign. Okay? Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, and th thy fellows that sit before thee. Now, first and last, you know she didn't get it when you posted it both in ESV and King James. You think she's going to get it now that you posted it in the King James? First and last, can I come and visit you, lay hands on you tonight? Let's try this again, first and last. Help your sister and post it in ESV. Allahu Akbar. Zechariah 3, verse 8. No, it's my bad, first last. I don't pay you nothing for nothing, okay? All right, Zechariah 3, verse 8. Perhaps I get it now. Follow. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. What part you don't get, Hepsa? Joshua and his friends who help him and serve with him, they are a sign. Did you catch it or no? A sign of who? Behold, I'll bring my servant the branch. I've got to make sure she's getting it. Did you get it? Before I move on, what does that got to do with the point, Hafsa? Hafsa, you got to answer me directly because if you're going to go off tangents, I have to move on and I can't waste any further time. What has it got to do with Jesus' tree of life? Focus on what I'm asking you, sister. Focus, please. Where are you bringing Jesus' tree of life? Do you see the point that Joshua and his friends are a sign of someone called the branch? Why are you confused about the branch and thinking it's the cross? Forget that for now. Allah Akbar. Okay. Hafsa. Hey, Okay. Sorry, guys. The point that I want you to focus on is not the branch and how does that apply to Jesus. You're jumping ahead. The point I want you to focus on is how Joshua the priest and his friends are a sign of that branch. To confirm the point I'm making, that Old Testament events, Old Testament persons, experience things by God's design that would point to something in the future. Why are you now still stuck on, what's the branch? Is it a is it a branch that has like apples on it? Is it a banana tree? Or is it an apple tree? Huh? Okay. Did we get that point? I'll get to who the branch is a little later. Decker, don't ask me about the third temple before I send you into the future to see if there's going to be a third temple. Okay. Did you get it now, Hafsa? Don't you love it, man? I'm warts and all. Okay. So did you understand? I love you too, sister. And I love you because you love Jesus. And Jesus saved you out of Islam and may he preserve you and all of us for the glory of Christ. Okay. But you understand what my point was? Don't focus on the branch. We'll get to who the branch is. Just be patient. So you went on branch. Branch tree? What kind of branch? Is it an apricot tree? Because I love apricots. What about banana? Hey, fam, I'm sure you got a banana tree because you look like a monkey. In fact, you're an oversized gorilla. All right. And we got it now? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm crying too inside, Al. Inside, I'm crying. Everyone got the point. Don't focus on branch yet. I promise you, we'll get to. I'll get to the what branch means, right? Right. I'll, I promise you. What I want you to focus on is that God says to Joshua through Zechariah. Zechariah, see Joshua. Zechariah, Joshua. You and your friends are a sign of someone else. To confirm this principle that the Old Testament, the stories, 
these events were meant to point to a greater reality. They're not simply events in the past. These are true historical events. The Exodus happened. Moses existed. But God is not simply reporting history for the sake of history. There's more to it. He's reporting it to show that he's a God of history who enters into time and space, into creation, to have a personal relationship with his creatures, to personally interact with his creatures, to protect his creatures, to provide for his creatures, to save them, and also design their life experiences to point to something in the future. Hence, the title of the session, Foreshadows of Christ in the Hebrew Bible. Mike, they always say that. Is that clear now? Did everyone understand what I'm trying to establish here? Did you guys get it? Before I can't move on if you don't get it. Yes, Kenneth. Kenneth. It's proof that not only is God the God of the Bible, he's the God of history, meaning he's all power over history to be able to guide these individuals, their circumstances, to be a picture of something greater and more beautiful. He's the God of history. He owns history and creation. Okay, so if you got it, that's the point. Joshua and his friends are a sign of something future. What, what in the future? When my branch comes. I'll explain my branch in a minute. Joshua, you are a picture and your friends are a picture of my servant, the branch. I'll explain that in a minute, but focus on that. So that's number one. Now let me show you Jesus and his followers confirming this method of interpreting the Old Testament, this method of looking into the Old Testament, where now I look at the Old Testament, I say, oh, Moses experienced something that Jesus experienced. Israel underwent certain trials that Jesus, oh, wow. So the way they live and their experiences and their encounters all point to things that happened to Jesus, pointing to Jesus, his mission, his work, his glorification. Oh, so all of it points to Jesus. Right? Is that clear? Because I want to show you from the New Testament. Are you ready? If you're not ready, let me know. So, someone tell me I'm still not getting it. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I guess, listen, as long as the Lord gives me health and holiness and provides, I'll be here teaching. So I'm not rushing through this. You see, I said I'm going to have to do more than one part because I want to make sure you get it. I'd rather you get it than me rush through this and you don't get it. Okay, now, let me show you New Testament confirmation of what I just said. I just showed you Zechariah 3.8. Now, let me show you Jesus confirming this principle that when you look to the Old Testament, these events point to me. So find where these events point to me and how they do so. John 3, 14 and 15. John 3, 14 and 15. And this should have been clear in your mind from my discussion of Melchizedek yesterday, Hebrews 7, 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have everlasting life. Did you catch it? The serpent points to Jesus hanging on the cross as a remedy for sin. So that bronze serpent, which God had Moses design as the remedy for the Israelites who were being bitten by poisonous snakes, and if they look to it, they'd be healed of that venom. Points to Christ being the remedy for human sin as he hung, hangs on a cross. Do you see this now? A foreshadowing of Jesus? You get it now? The bronze serpent is pointing to something greater. Jesus. Matthew 1240. Tell CP, shut down his boring live stream. We're sick and tired of him saying, potato, Abdul, potato. <laughs> but come and learn your Bible, man. I'm just kidding. Don't say that to him. Matthew 12, 40. Here's another one. Are you ready? Here's another one. For as Jonas, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see again? See, Jonah is a picture, a shadow of me. Like Jonah, so to me. Just as Jonah, so to the Son of Man. Did you catch it again? The story of Jonah, which is true history. It actually happened. 
being entombed in the belly of a great sea creature for three days and three nights, being entombed in the, the belly of a great sea creature for three days and three nights, was deliberately designed to point to Jesus being entombed in the belly of the earth. Okay? Second example I gave you, right? Everyone with me? Let's go to Romans 5.14. What about Adam? Romans 5.14. Second example from New Testament from the Lord Jesus. Now, what is, what is Paul saying? Romans 5.14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Post it one more time. Adam is a figure, a picture of the one to come. Did you catch it? Read the last part. Have some everyone else. Adam points. He is a shadow, a picture, an analogy of someone else. He is a figure pointing to the one to come. You got that one? Everyone got that before I move on? Colossians 2, 16 to 17. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. I don't know why you put two, theistic. Are you playing with me? You got it or not? Watch here. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now put it in the ESV, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Put it in the ESV. Paul is saying, you Gentiles who've been freed from many aspects of the Mosaic law that ethnic Jews follow, don't let those ethnic Jews condemn you because you can eat whatever you want and you're not observing their holy days or their Sabbaths, right? Why? Because here, watch here. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Did you see what Paul just told you? The Sabbath points to Christ. The foods point to Christ. <clears throat> the holy days point to Christ. The priesthood points to Christ. <clears throat> the sacrificial system points to Christ. Passover points to Christ. All of it points to to Christ. Deckard, you need to get out of here. Don't come back. Don't ever dare come back for perverting the scripture to your shame and destruction because I'll humiliate you. Get this guy out of here. Okay. Are you with me there? So if you believe the New Testament, the New Testament told you Christians, all of it points to Christ. The temple the sacrificial system, the priesthood, the holy days, the Passover, Moses, the Exodus, the pit, all of it points to Christ. I'm going to show you how it does. Okay? So that's another passage. Now, these are four New Testament passages. Two from Jesus himself, two from Paul, right? Hebrews 7.3, which we read yesterday. Thank you guys for your support. Keep, keep it coming so we can do the ministry for the glory of Christ. There's a lot of big things happening for me this year. I got two debates this month, God willing, online. One with the Mormon and one with the Unitarian heretic, son of Satan. Anyway, Hebrews 7, verse 3. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. Did you catch it? So even Melchizedek is pointing to Christ. Even Melchizedek is a shadow of Christ. Hebrews 8, 5, verse 5. Yeah, if you want, first and last, just stick with ESV for now, for these passages, and I'll tell you, go back to the King James in a minute. Hebrews 8, verse 5. The temple. They serve a copy and shadow. Do you guys catch it again? A copy and shadow. The priest that served the temple in Jerusalem, they're serving in a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses is about to erect the tent that was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Hebrews 10, verse 1. 
Thank you, Jesus, my God. May he bless you. Hebrews 10, verse 1. It's going to be online, Kenneth. I'll give you information later, but just focus. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow. Wow. Guys, how many more passages do I need to quote to instill in you, to ingrain in you by the power of the Holy Spirit? Everything in the Old Testament points to Christ. All of it is the shadow. Even the law of Moses, all of it is but a shadow. It's not the reality of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Did you guys see it now? Now that's six passages. No, seven. I'm sorry. I forgot Hebrews 7, 3. My bad. Three from Hebrews. Seven. Do you know that even the flood of Noah and the ark of Noah point to Christ? The flood of Noah, the ark of Noah point to Christ. 1 Peter 3, 19 and 21. First Peter 3, 19 to 21. Take care. Are you going? All right, Lord be with you, and you can listen to it later, so you're not going to lose anything. In which he went, Jesus went, and proclaimed to the, to the spirits in prison. Guys, pay attention. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought, least, brought safely through water, Right? Now watch this. You're skipping something, aren't you? There's um, something missing from 1 Peter 3.20 because it goes through water. I guess you didn't have the period. That's where you're throwing me out. Notice 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Did you catch it? Baptism. Noah's flood. Noah's ark. The flood waters is a picture of being baptized into Christ. Now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you guys catch it now? Exactly, Louisa. And I'll unpack 1 Peter 3 in the future. I can't unpack it right now. Just be patient. I will unpack it, Lord willing, in the future. But are you seeing a pattern now? Even the flood, even the ark, point to Jesus Christ, death and resurrection, and our union with him, which baptism <clears throat> symbolizes and represents. Right? Are you seeing this pattern? Before I move on? Now, let me give you a foretaste, just one for now. One for now. How what you read in the Old Testament points to Christ. Let's take the Passover. The Passover. Let's go to Revelation 5, verse 6. Revelation 5, verse 6. Now, folks, if you're patient with me, and if the Lord gives me health and holiness and provision, I will unpack all of this slowly but surely over the course of the upcoming weeks and months and years because I can't do it all in one session. So don't rush me, please. Just be patient. Just be patient because I can't do it all in one session. Right? Okay, Revelation 5, 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the others, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, I'm not going to explain what it means that Jesus has seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. I did that in a previous session. I will explain it in the future again, God willing. What I want to focus on is pay attention to this. What I want to focus on is this one. A lamb Though slain, but standing. Okay. A lamb standing, even though it had been slain. Now, in the Greek word, there are two words for, for lamb. Amnos and Arnios, I believe. Let me double check. Let me not go by memory like I did yesterday embarrass myself. Amnos and Arnios. Hold on. Let me just check it out. I'm going to say thank God for modern technology. I hate when I go by memory because I'll sometimes, right? See it? Yep, here it goes. In John 1.29, here's the link, John 1.29. Arnios or Arnion. There you'll see that John says, behold, the Amnos. 
of God. Amnos of God. That's the word for lamb. It's a ge generic word for lamb. But in Revelation 5, 6, that's not the Greek word that John uses. Okay, let me give you the Greek word. Okay, let me give you the Greek word. Here you go. Yeah, that's an accusative. Armion, that's an accusative, right? Why not? What am I doing? Armion is the what they call the nominative. Again, I'm not trying to confuse people with grammar. Okay, hold on. Yep, Arnion. It comes from Arnios. Arnios, okay? No, it's Arnion. You're right. Yeah, sorry about that. See, that just tells you I got to keep studying Greek because it is Arnion. Hmm, interesting. So it's not Arnios. See, again, thank the Lord Jesus. He, he saves me from error <clears throat> as we live stream. Okay, Arnion. Anyway, I got confused because in, in Greek you have different case endings. Like, for example, you have Theos. That's nominative, theon, with the nu, that's <clears throat> accusative. Theo, that's dative, right? Theu, with ou, that's genitive, and who cares? <laughs> You're like, who cares, man? Okay, anyway, arnion. Folks, do you know what arnion means? Yeah, I speak Assyrian. Arnion, I just gave you the link. It means a young Young lamb, a small lamb, a baby lamb. I just gave you the link. Okay, now, now, yeah, make sure you listen to this later, theistic, because you're going to be blown away with these <clears throat> patterns in the Hebrew Bible pointing to Jesus. Okay, now, no, it's not that it's cute, Jojo. Why is Jesus appearing as a young male baby lamb? Because he's a male, right? Why is he appearing as a young baby lamb that looked like it was slain, but it's alive? Understand the imagery. Understand the imagery. He was slain, but he's alive. That means Jesus appeared as a young baby male lamb with the, the throat slit. Because how did they kill lambs? They would slit the throat. But he's alive and he's walking. So he's a living lamb that had been slaughtered, but he's a young male lamb. Do you know why? Exodus 12. Exodus 12, the Passover lamb, was a one-year-old male lamb. One-year-old male lamb. So here Jesus is appearing as a male lamb that's young to signify he is our Passover. So that Christians are now experiencing a new Passover. And there's a new Passover lamb that's been slain. And there's a new Moses and a new covenant, and a new <clears throat> law, and a new lawgiver, and a new <clears throat> Egypt, and a new wilderness, and a new Canaan, and a new Joshua. All of the Old Testament is being now relived in Jesus Christ. Yes, a new Exodus, man. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Now, I don't know why you guys are letting Illinois, this demon, this dog of the devil here. I would read it to your mother and your daughter who gets molested under the guise of muta by your prophet. Your prophet treats women like whores and you say nothing. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Read here. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Did you see what Paul just did with the unleavened bread of the Exodus? He says that unleavened bread represents us, the bread of God. And we have to be unleavened because leaven represents sin that corrupts. So we are the unleavened bread of God. And Jesus is our Passover. Did you catch it now? Who didn't catch it? You see how the unleavened bread points to the body of Christ as the batch of unleavened bread? 
And leaven represents sin that you need to remove or it'll permeate and corrupt the body, the batch. And Jesus is the Passover lamb, which is why he appeared as a young male lamb with the, th the throat slit but was alive. I don't know if you're getting it. I don't know if it's sunk in or it puts you to sleep and you're bored with this. I'm preparing you for what's to come. Everyone got it? Right? So everyone sees how all of it is pointing to Jesus Christ. All of it. The Passover, the unleavened bread, the, the plate. In fact, here, guys, can I, can I share another thing to blow you away? Here. Okay. What was the second to last plague? What was the second to last plague that fell on the Egyptians, according to Exodus? The second to last plague. There were 10 plagues. What were the last two? The second to last plague. 100% he is, the Afikomen, which comes actually after the time of Christ. But I don't want to open that up right now. No, the second to last plague was pitch darkness over the land of Egypt, except Goshen, where the Israelites were, where they had the perpetual light of God, the, the complete darkness for three days. Then came the Passover lamb and the death of the firstborn. Is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence? Jesus is God's firstborn who was slain and darkness covered the land. Do you catch it? Jesus is now crucified on Passover. Notice it's Passover, right? It's Passover. And when he's crucified, that's God's firstborn who's being slain. And darkness covered the land. Send truth on his merry way because he's distracting us. He's not paying attention. Attention. And right? Everyone got it now? And how long did the darkness last upon the Egyptians? For three days. Jesus, the light of the world was engulfed in darkness for three days, and then the light broke through on the third day. It was darkness, then animals, and the firstborn. It's not so much the chronology letter. Just notice that they coincide. Darkness, Passover, firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn who's actually now Crucified on Passover and darkness over the land. You with me there? Are you, are you guys catching it or no? I don't know if you are, man. I don't know if it's like you guys. <sighs> yep, exactly. And then pay attention to the Passover lamb. Right? You would have to eat the flesh. None of its bones could be broken, Mike. And then you would take the blood, mix it with bitter herbs and hyssop, and you put it on the, the side, the top and the side of the doors. And when God sees the blood, he passes you over. That's why it's called Passover. Death passes you over, right? Jesus is nailed to the cross. And according to John 19, 36, none of his bones were broken, quoting Exodus 12, 46, right? And you have to eat his flesh, and you have to be covered by his blood, so death passes you over. And not only that, the bitter herbs represents his bitter death, and he was offered hyssop on the cross. No air. Uh, maybe, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what you mean, Darren's being expected. Air, are you suggesting? Yeah, I don't know what you mean. See, this is why when you chime in here, you're going to throw me off. Are you saying, oh, I say again, forget it. Eric, do me a favor. Don't help me by comment because now you got me curious to see what you mean. I'm going to go off topic. Don't do that to me here, please. I love you, brother. Don't do that to me because some people think that Jesus was crucified the night before they, they <clears throat> slew the Passover lambs. Yeah. No, because you're going to make me now want to know what you said because Jesus was crucified when the Passover lambs, right? See, forget about it, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Aaron. I wish you were close to me so I can lay hands on your mouth and bless you. Love you, brother. Okay. 
Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Yeah, not only do the bitter herbs represent the vinegar, but man, it, it represents bitter death. Jesus is bitter death, right? Why is it bitter herbs? Why say bitter herbs? Because his death was bitter. Okay, so you everyone got that? This is just to whet your appetite about going deeper into the text and finding Jesus everywhere in the Hebrew Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit as he guides me and saves me from error and confusion and illuminates you to understand these issues. So I'm just trying to go slow with this. Go slow with this. Right? Go slow with this. Okay. Let me make another connection for you guys because I haven't even got into the meat. This is all preparatory, laying the foundation. This is why when I do a session where I lay the foundation for a topic, go back, re-listen to it so that I can build on the foundation and not repeat it over and over and over again. Okay? Let me show you something else. Jesus was crucified on the festival of Passover, right? The feast of the Passover, one of the Jewish festivals, right? It was Passover, correct? Correct? Okay. So it was Passover. Jesus was crucified. Now again, use the SV. When did it become dark? Mark 15, 33. When did it become dark? Watch here. Watch this connection. Mark 15, 33. When did it become dark? And when he, when, uh, is that ESV, brother? Or is that King James? I'm going to lay hands on you too, bro. No, not, not ninth hour. No, brother. What are you quoting now, first and last? Okay, see, I'm going to have to lay hands on ESV. Use the NIV so they can know what the sixth hour is. Stick with ESV. I mean, NIV. We're going to go back to the King James, and I'm just trying to help people because these are deep issues, and I don't want the language to be a barrier. Right? When did it become dark? Mark 15, 33. The sixth hour in Jewish reckoning is noon. Notice here, guys, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. So Jesus is hanging on the cross, and it becomes dark at noon. At noon, the sun goes down from their vantage point and becomes pitch dark. Okay. And this is taking place in one of their feasts, their festivals, the Passover land. And who is Jesus? Hebrews 1, verse 6. Hebrews 1, verse 6. Who is Jesus? Hebrews 1, verse 6. Yeah, don't focus on how long the darkness lasted. Allahu Akbar. Focus when it became dark. Hebrews 1, verse 6. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, so Jesus is the firstborn. He is crucified on one of the Jewish feast festivals, and it becomes dark at noon. Okay. Go to Amos chapter 8, verses 9 to 10. Amos chapter 8, verses 9 to 10. Let's see if you guys make the connection. He hadn't died yet, King of Kings, yes, but yes. Here's Amos, chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, Adonai, Yehovah, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious festivals into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. And John 3.16 and John 1.14, Jesus is the only begotten son and the firstborn. Did you catch it? God said in Amos, here's a sign of my judgment upon you for your sin. I'm going to make the sun go down at noon during your feast days, and I'm going to make you mourn so bitterly as when someone mourns the loss of an only son. Did you catch it? Jesus, the firstborn, the only son, 
is nailed on the cross on one of their festivals, their feast days, the Passover, and then it becomes dark at noon. Who's not catching it? You guys went to sleep here. You didn't catch it. It's not a prophecy about Jesus per se. What it's saying is, here's a sign. I'm angry with you and my judgment is upon you. Israel, do you want to know when my judgment will fall upon you? Here's how you're going to know. I'm going to make it go complete dark, darkness at noon when the sun is at its brightest during your festivals. And I'm going to make you mourn so bitterly as if you lost an only son. That means someone who knows the Old Testament would look at Jesus on the cross and it becomes completely dark at noon during their festivals and they'd recall, hey, that's Amos. God's judgment is being poured out. His wrath is being poured out, but on who? The one hanging on the cross. He's taking their judgment. You caught it? No, I don't think you're catching it. No, I don't think it's sunk in. I don't think you guys got it. I think you guys are like, this is too much. This is boring. Shut down. Yep. In John 1, 14, John 1, 18, John 3, 16, John 3, 18, Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, Monogenes, and the only begotten Son of the Father, only begotten Son of God. And 1 John 4, 9 says the same thing, only begotten Son. So are you seeing how everything is pointing to Jesus? Even a passage, Amos 8, Verses 9 to 10, which is not a prophecy about Jesus. He's simply saying, here is how you're going to know I'm bringing judgment upon you Jews, upon you Israelites, upon your land. Here's how I know I'm angry with you and I'm not punishing you for your sin because I'm fed up. I'm going to make it go completely dark at noon during your festivals. And the judgment will be so bad. You're going to be mourning so bad. You're going to be mourning as if you lost your only son. That's how you're going to know my judgment is upon you. Passover, a Jewish festival, God's only son, his firstborn, hanging on the cross. And it goes completely dark at noon. That means the attentive student of the Old Testament would say, wow, it's Passover, one of our festivals, and it's dark at noon. God is angry. His wrath is being poured out, but we're okay. Oh, it's that one, the only son of God, who's now eating up God's wrath in our place. So I want it to sink in before I move on. If this is all sunk in and you got the point, what's the point I want you to get today? Exactly, Kenneth. All of these connections, Kent, are supernaturally designed. And these connections are some of the proofs, overwhelming proofs that the Holy Spirit gives to us have no doubt this Bible is God's word and the God of this Bible is real and you need to believe this book in order to know him and be in love with him and be saved. Okay, now before I move on, I want you to think. Well, think with me now. Do you see the confirmation that these events in the Old Testament, the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the life of Adam and Eve, the lives of the kings and the prophets and the lives of Israel, they were designed in such a way. These are all true historical events. These are facts of history. They did experience what the Bible says they experienced, but they were designed in such a way by the sovereign Lord of history to point to Jesus. This is why I titled this session, Four shadows of Christ in the Hebrew Bible. These are all shadows. If it's a shadow, now wh why is it called shadow? Let me break that down. A shadow, if you see a shadow, that means you know someone's coming. So if I'm standing, let's say, at a street corner, and there's an alley, and I see a shadow, I know someone's coming. And by the shape of the shadow, it may give me an idea of who's coming. So if I see a shadow that looks like a dog, I know a dog is coming. If I see a shadow that looks like a cat, I know a cat is coming. You get the point? So the shadow gives me an idea. Someone's coming, and this is what he will look like. 
You with me there? So the shadow is not the reality, but the shadow guarantees that reality is coming. The reality is around the corner. And the shadow will give you an idea of who's coming and what to look for. You understand why it's called the shadow now? By the power of the Holy Spirit guiding me to explain it clearly so you can get it and sinks in. Right? So again, I'm going to repeat it. If I see a shadow looks like a dog, you know a lion isn't coming. If I see a shadow looks like a cat, you know it's not a chimpanzee. Right? It's not a chimpanzee. If the shadow looks like a cat, that means a cat's going to show up. Now, if a cat doesn't show up, either that was a demon that changed his shape, or I'm starting to hallucinate, or I need to put down the pipe or put down the bottle because, man, homie, my mind's playing tricks on me. Man, homie, my mind's playing tricks on me. You getting it now? So the Old Testament shadow is telling you, hey, someone's coming, and this is what he's going to look like. So the shadow is giving an idea of what he's going to look like and what he's going to do. And so Jesus comes, and he says, that's me. That shadow is me. That shadow gave you an idea of what I'm going to be look, what I'm going to be like, and what I'm going to do. And here I am, and I'm doing everything that that sh shadow indicated to you to expect from me when I show up. Right? Do I move on? Before I move on, I want it to sink in. So is that clear? Both the Old Testament and New Testament prepares the readers to view the Old Testament as one big shadow, one big sign pointing to something greater, types, prototypes, or antitype, type, antitype. But I like to use prototype, right? Because Jesus precedes all creation, and he designed all of it to point to him who is the beginning of all creation. He created it, he brought it into being, and he sustains it, gives life to it with the Father and the Holy Spirit working together as one God, right? So you're seeing that? Because if you're now seeing that, I want to now prepare you for the second element. This is all preparatory. I'm all laying down a foundation. So I got to do a part two before I get into the meat, okay? The second point I want you to see is that the Old Testament reveals the various names and titles of the Messiah, titles that actually connect him with persons and events in the Old Testament as further indication that when you see these persons, they are meant to point you to the Messiah, Jesus. Let me repeat. Some of the names given to Jesus the Messiah are names of certain individuals or even people groups that were deliberately given so that you can now look to these people, look to these groups as pointing to the Messiah in some sense, in some way. And I thank the triune God. Remember what I said in the beginning? It's not me. It's the triune God. And rest in him that the triune God is more real than you can imagine. He is alive. He is real. Physical death is not the end of us. We will live forever with this God who loves you, Anna. Have no doubt. Sleep better at night knowing this. Okay, understand what I just said? That in the Old Testament, the Messiah to come, the Messiah to come, is given the names of people groups and individuals, right? As further indication that you're supposed to look at those groups and those individuals as pointing to someone greater to come, the Messiah. Two of the names given to Jesus. Are you ready? Two of the names given to Jesus. Are you ready now? Two of the names given to Jesus, the Messiah, happen to be David and Israel. In the Hebrew Bible, two of Jesus' names are David and Israel. Not Emmanuel, Remy. I know he's called Emmanuel, but that's not the point. Because how, how? show me an Emmanuel in the Old Testament that points to Jesus, Remy. Is there another Emmanuel in the Old Testament that points to Jesus? No. Let me repeat what I said, Remy, because I don't think you got it. Let's try this again, because you got to get it, Remy. I'm going to look for you lay hands on you, too. 
Okay, listen to what I just said. Some of the names given to the Messiah are the names of people, groups, or individuals. Why? Because those individuals, those people, groups, are going to be designed to point to him in some sense. Yeah, Medica, that's one of them, but it's not. he's not called Joshua in the Old Testament. So although Joshua is a picture of Christ, Medic, he's not called Joshua in the Old Testament. So you, I don't think you're getting it either, which is okay. I'll repeat myself because if, if you don't get it, then I fail as a teacher. Let's try it one more time. I am not talking about names of the Messiah that are not given to no one else. Nor am I talking about individuals who point to the Messiah, but whose name are not attributed to the Messiah. Right? Joshua is a picture of Messiah, but in the Old Testament, we are not said that Messiah's name is Joshua. Emmanuel is the name of Jesus, but there is no other Emmanuel in the Old Testament that points to Jesus as Emmanuel. Are you getting it now? I'm talking about names of individuals and groups in the Old Testament that are also given to the Messiah. Are you guys getting it now? It's okay. I'll repeat myself. So don't tell me Joshua. Yes, Joshua is a picture of Jesus. But where in the Old Testament is the Messiah said to be Joshua or that he'll be called Joshua? Yes, he is called Emmanuel in Isaiah 7, 14. That is Jesus. But where do you find someone else in the Old Testament called Emmanuel that points to Jesus as Emmanuel? So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people that point to Jesus but whose name are not ascribed to Jesus, right, in the Old Testament, like, and he will come, Joshua, doesn't say that. Nor am I talking about a prophet says, when he comes, he'll be called Emmanuel. Yes, but is there someone else called Emmanuel in the Old Testament? No. That points to him? No. Are you getting it? Before you ask me why, Leather, I have to make sure you're getting it before I can move to the next point. Who's not getting it? Everyone getting it? Don't just tell me, okay, and you're not getting it. Let me know you're getting it so I can move on. Because if not, we can't move on because then you won't be able to use it. And your witness in your Bible studies and your evangelism. Okay, if someone's not getting it, let me know. Okay. Here. Sorry, I got to charge it. Okay. Okay, if no one if, if everyone's on page, two of the names given to the Messiah, two of the names given to the Messiah are David and Israel. Can I now prove that? Can I now show you that the Messiah to come is called David and he's called Israel? And you guys already know this. First Last knows this because First Last has been on online several times when I've discussed this. He can teach this now. No, not wrestling, Cloudy. Cloudy, I love you, brother. You know, don't make me do harikari. Okay. <clears throat> Let me show you where. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. Louisa, Jesus, the Messiah, is called Israel. Why? Because he is true Israel who did what the nation of Israel failed to do. So there should be no confusion. Jesus is called David. Why? Because David, his ancestor, is a picture of Jesus. And everything that David failed to do, Jesus does. But be patient. I don't know why you'd be confused. Just be patient. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. Post it one more time, guys. First and last, post it one more time. Yeah, let's just stick with ESV for now. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples, from afar. The Lord Jehovah called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. Okay? Now pay attention. Please. You got to pay attention. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. So the speaker says, God has fashioned me, formed me in the womb of my mother, and he called me by name, and he made me his tool of judgment, his tool of destruction, his tool of, tool of wrath. I'm his sword. 
to punish evildoers. I'm his arrow to strike down his enemies. That's who I am. God's agent of salvation and judgment. I punish and I destroy his enemies and I save the righteous who believe. That's who I am. Notice verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword and I slay you dead with my words. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. Now notice what his name is. Notice what his name is. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. So this servant who's speaking through Isaiah says, I am God's servant. He formed me in my mother's womb to be his servant. I am his, I'm his agent and tool of judgment to, to punish and judge evildoers, but also his agent of salvation to save those who believe in him. And my name is Israel. But hold on, before I move on, before you get excited, if I stop at verse 3, then this is referring to the nation Israel. Because in Isaiah 41 onwards, the nation Israel is called God's servant. So the nation, Israel, is God's servant, and he rebukes them and says, You are my servant, Jacob, my servant, Israel, but you are blind and deaf and sinful and wicked. So then how do I know in Isaiah 49.3, God is not talking about the nation? Okay? How do I know that here in Isaiah 49, when the person says, He called me Israel, it's not talking about the nation. How do I know it's not the nation that's speaking here? I know it because of verses 4 to 6. Let's post Isaiah 49, verses 3 to 6. Isaiah 49, verses 3 to 6. Now pay careful attention. Riaz and others have listened to this before, so they get it. They know it. For the newbies who are not getting it, pay att uh, careful attention. Isaiah 49, verses 3 to 6. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have wasted my energy. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with Jehovah and my recompense, my reward is with my God. And now Jehovah, the Lord says, he who formed me, Israel, from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of Jehovah and my God has become my strength. He says to me, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now, I'm really confused. The one speaking says, I am Jehovah's servant, and he named me Israel. So I am Israel, Jehovah's servant. But then Jehovah said to me, you are more than a servant. You're much greater than that. And you're going to do more than save Israel and the remnant of Israel. You're going to be my light to bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I thought the servant is Israel. But here it says that servant Israel will be sent to save Israel and the preserved of Israel and also the ends of the earth. So Israel will save Israel and the world. How many Israels is that? How many Israels is that? Reread it, folks. I can't move on if you don't get it. What would be absurd, Leather? How many Israels is that? Now let's again post Isaiah 49, 3, 5 to 6. Let's skip verse 4. Many of you got it, some of you didn't, because I don't know why he said it's absurd. Okay, that's what you meant. Okay, but leather, it does say the servant Israel will save Israel. You have two Israels here, or is it one of the same? Isaiah 49, 3 and 5 and 6. Louisa, let's read again. Guys, read. Isaiah 49, 3, and we skip to 5 and 6. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And now the Lord Jehovah says, he who formed me... The one who called, whom he called Israel from the womb to be his servant, my servant Israel, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of Jehovah and my God has become my strength. Right? It is too light of a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserve of Israel. I'll make you as a light, right, <clears throat> for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. 
Who's not getting it? God speaks to his servant Israel. He says, you are my servant Israel, but you're more than a servant. And you're going to do more than just simply save Israel and the remnant of Israel. So you, Israel, are going to do more than simply save Israel and the remnant of Israel. You'll be the light of the nations to bring my salvation to all the world. How many Israels in Isaiah 49? How many Israels? So the servant Israel, one person, and the nation Israel, and this one specific person Israel is going to save the nation Israel and also bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So did you catch it? This servant who is one person, a single human person, he's called Israel, and then you have the nation Israel. Here you have Old Testament proof that the Messiah, God's servant, who is Jesus, his name is Israel. You got it, Billy Mandalay. You got it. Okay. If everyone got it, we're going to move on to where Messiah is called David. If you're still confused, then we will wait. Exactly, medic. He's more than a servant. He's more than human. He's God in the flesh. And that's even from Isaiah itself. But I don't want to go there yet. If you're confused, don't be scared. Let me know, man. That's why I'm here. I can't move on. Luis, are you sure you got it? Everyone got it? All right. So now I've given you Old Testament proof. One of the names of the Messiah is Israel. So you have the nation Israel, and he's called Israel, right? Now, where is he called David? Where is he called David? Okay, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 to 6. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. Yeah, but you got to be careful, medic, because God used human beings to save. In Obadiah chapter 1, verse 21, medic, it says God will raise up saviors to save Israel from the onslaught of the Edomites. So you're going to have to use a better, stronger argument than that. That's not going to prove the deity of Jesus. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. Okay, read with me. Guys, here's where I need you to pay attention. Read. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord Jehovah, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch. There's that word, Hepsa. There's that word branch that was in Zechariah 3. Where Joshua and his friends were a sign of my servant, the branch. Here is the branch again, Hepsa. Behold, the days are coming, declares Jehovah. And it's the same word in Hebrew. It's simach, simach. Okay? But now pay attention. Behold, the days are coming, declares Jehovah, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as a king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. So this branch who is righteous, this branch from David, a physical descent of David, he will be the righteous king who will save Judah. But his name is also Jehovah is our righteousness. What? You guys catch it? This is a branch from David's line, meaning a physical descendant of David. This physical descendant of David, he is a righteous king, a just king who will save Judah, but he has another name. He's not just a branch. He's also Jehovah is our righteousness. So he is Jehovah, who is our righteousness, who is a human branch, a human descendant of David. Who's not getting this? So a branch of David, meaning a human descendant of David, is going to be the king who will save Judah. And this branch, who is a physical son of David, his name is Jehovah's our righteousness. That sure sounds like the God man, huh? Okay. Let's go to Jeremiah 33, verses 15 to 16. Pay attention. Here's where I got to need you guys to pay attention. Yep, I said that already, Abdul Halaj. 
But I guess you're not listening. Early in Isaiah 11, 1, my brother from different mother, I said there he's called Netzer, Notzer, right? Netzer. The Netzer from Yeshi, Jesse, the father of David. So repent, Abdul Hadij. But here in Jeremiah 23 and 33, he's called Simach, which is the same word used in Zechariah 3 8. You sinner. But anyway, Jeremiah 33, 15 and 16. Here's the prophecy stated again. The prophecy stated again. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. A righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, Jehovah is our righteousness. Now, when Jeremiah wrote this, keep in mind, when Jeremiah wrote this, the physical David had been dead for about 500 years. The prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah was writing about 500 years after the death of David. Okay? Are you with me here? He's writing at the time where the Babylonians have attacked Jerusalem and taken the Jews into captivity in Babylon. So David was physically dead, right? Everyone got it? David was physically dead when Jeremiah wrote these prophecies. But now here's where I get confused. Jeremiah 30, verses 8 to 9. Here's where I get confused. Jeremiah 30, verses 8 to 9. About 500 years. David wrote about 1,000 years before Christ. Jeremiah's writing in the 6th century B.C. in the 500s. When the Babylonians have come to power and dominance and have exiled the Jews into Babylon and they're about to be destroyed by the Persians. Anyway, Jeremiah 30, verses 8 to 9. Lopez, this is now four times I just repeated it. Allahu Akbar. Jeremiah 30, verses 8 to 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, declares Jehovah, the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke, but they shall serve Jehovah their God and David their king, whom I'll raise up for them. Now I'm really confused. David has been a dead for about 500 years because David lived about a thousand years before Christ. Now, this is the fifth time I repeated. And when Lopez asked me, I repeated it. Then he asked me the question again. It's okay. Lopez, you know, he is. he's Hispanic. He's not Middle Eastern, so it takes him a lot longer to figure it out. It's okay, brother. Baruch Hashem. Jeremiah is writing in the 6th century BC, in the 500s before the birth of Christ, which means about 500 years after David was dead, when Babylon has come to power, and has attacked Jerusalem and taken the people captive and brought them into <clears throat> captivity in Babylon and did it more than once. There was not just one time they did it. They took one group and then they took a second group and some people believe they took a third group. And there was the Babylonians who then destroyed the temple, burned it and Jerusalem, right, around 586 B.C. So Jeremiah's writing, about 500 years after the death of David. David is physically dead. But here, okay, so he's Middle Eastern too, all right. But here it says that God will destroy the yoke of the Jews' oppressors. He'll destroy the yoke, yoke of these Gentile pagan rulers oppressing them. And then it says they, the Jews, will serve Jehovah their God and David their king. Jeremiah 30, verse 6. Jeremiah 30, verse 6. Let's read it. I'm sorry. Jeremiah 30, verse 9. Sorry. Jeremiah 30, verse 9. I thought of 6 because I was thinking of Jeremiah 23. I apologize. See, even my computer shuts down. Jeremiah 20. Uh, Je see? Jeremiah 30, verse 9. Holy Spirit, guide me and loosen my tongue to speak truth for the glory of Jesus. Jeremiah 30, verse 9. You see why some of these brothers kill me? We're talking about Jesus being called David. And now this guy wants to talk about the millennium reign of Christ. Why? I still don't understand. With my issues and my imperfections, why would you make me a teacher? Why? Okay. Now I can understand why Moses, why Moses in Numbers 11, Numbers 11 said, God, you must hate me that you made me leader over Israel. It's actually Numbers 11. I'm not lying. He got so sick and disgusted with the people. He goes, is that how much you hate me? You made me the leader of such a people. And then you know what he said? 
He goes, if I find favor in your sight, let me die. I'd rather die than lead these people. Folks, you're getting me close to that point. Why? I have serious anger and patient issues. I'm not meant to teach. I'm talking about Jesus be called David, and here he's telling me millennium, so I can get into a discussion about the thousand years, if that's literal or spiritual. Why? I don't have your patience. Why? Why couldn't I be an IT guy and make millions and live somewhere in an island? Why? Why couldn't I pursue bodybuilding, took steroids and growth hormone, and then I would have an eight pack and I'd be ripped and I'd be on magazines and all the models would throw themselves at me. Why? Okay. Okay, with me there? Jeremiah 30, verse 9. Exactly. Jeremiah 30, verse 9. Okay. But they shall serve the Lord Jehovah, their God, and David, their king, whom I will raise up for them. Okay. When Jeremiah wrote this, David was dead. He says, I will raise, them, raise up David for them. Now, is Jeremiah saying... God will physically raise up David, resurrect David physically to start ruling over them. Is that what he's saying in here in Jeremiah 30 verse 9? Is that what he's saying? Because he says, I will raise up David for them and he'll be their king. Not if you read, not if you read the context. Because Cloudy, you remember? Jeremiah 23 comes before Jeremiah 30, and Jeremiah 33 comes after Jeremiah 30. So now let's read these passages one by one, side by side. Let's go to Jeremiah 30, verse 9, Jeremiah 30, verse 21, Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. So let's go to Jeremiah 30, verse 9. We start with that. Then Jeremiah 30, verse 21, the same chapter. Then Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. Okay, let's read side by side, back to back. Let's see if we can now understand Jeremiah. But they shall serve Jehovah their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. But then in the same chapter, it says, their prince shall be one of themselves. Wait, wait, I thought it's David. No, it's not David. Their prince will be one of themselves. Their ruler shall come out from their midst. I'll make him draw near me and he shall approach me. For who would dare of himself to approach me, declare Jehovah. But wait, Jehovah, he said David. But now he's saying, no, it's going to be from among them. A prince and a ruler from among them who will approach me and can approach me, even though no one dares to approach me because I'm holy. So is it David or one of one of these Judeans? Among them, a ruler, a prince. But then, God, you confused me because earlier you said in Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6, Behold, the days are coming, declare Jehovah, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. So you're not raising up David. You're raising up a righteous branch from David who will be one of their own, from their midst, a ruler and prince. So God, who are you raising up? David or raising up for David, from their midst, a prince, a ruler, from the house of David. He will reign. He will be the one served, who happens to be Jehovah of righteousness. So if you read Jeremiah in context, is it actually David who's being raised up physically? Or is it a physical descendant of David, a Jew from their midst who has the boldness to approach God, even though others know better than to approach him, who is righteous, who's also called Jehovah Righteousness? Okay. Okay. So then why mention David? Because that's one of the names of Messiah. That's my point. He is not David, but he's called David because David is a picture of him. He's a physical descendant of David. So he's called David because his physical ancestor is a picture of him. And this physical descendant is so holy and righteous that in Jeremiah 30, 21... It says that he will approach me even though others do not dare to approach me. See, no one else would dare approach me, but he will. Do you know why? Because he is righteous, he's holy, and he is Jehovah, our righteousness. Did it sink in now? 
Did it make sense? Before I move on? Who's not, who didn't get it? So now if you got it, do you see now Old Testament proof? Old Testament proof that Jesus the Messiah is called David and Israel. Those are two of his many names. Yeah, but in Daniel 7, he's not called David or Israel, even though he is the son of man who is God appearing in human form distinct from the Father who is the Ancient of Days. Yeah, exactly, Lopez. That's what you meant. God, yes, brother. God bless you. That's what you meant. Lord bless you. Yes, yes, yes. That's the connection. Jeremiah 30 verse 21 does connect with Daniel 7 because that son of man approaches into God's heavenly presence to sit in throne with him as co-ruler who receives the same worship that the Ancient of Days who is the father receives. Yes, that's the connection. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know where you're going with that. Yes. Okay. Everyone got this? Yes, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is a king as David was, but greater because David failed. He had moral failures, but this one will never fail. So David is a picture of him. Solomon is a picture of him. And I'll show you that if you're patient, if you're patient and you don't ask questions not related to the topic. And if you pray for me to get healthier and holier, and more faithful, more love with Jesus, and pray for the financial provision for the ministry, and pray that God bless my daughters, love them, and shine on them, and protect them, and comfort them, and bring them sooner to me, so they are not irreparably damaged by not having their Baba there, in Jesus' name, to convict their mother to repent, and fear the Lord, and stop bringing men into their lives. Please, Lord, I will do this, because Jesus doesn't need me to teach you. He doesn't. He can take me home now, or he can allow me to fall into sin and shame myself and discredit myself and hand me over because he doesn't need me. He doesn't. We need him. Okay. Nobody's confused so far? Did everyone see the ample evidence that all the major players and figures in the Old Testament and these events all designed by the God of creation, the Lord of history, who's all powerful over history and guides all history, to be a picture of Jesus to come. You got that proof? And did you get proof right now that two of the names of Messiah, two of the names of Messiah are David and Israel? David and Israel. Two of the names of Messiah, David and Israel. Everyone got that? Because now I'm going to end it with an exposition of Isaiah 49 to show you how Isaiah 49 is fulfilled in Jesus. Are you ready? Isaiah 49, according to New Testament, is fulfilled in Jesus. Because I'm going to end it with that. And God willing, tomorrow, now we can get into the shadows. Tomorrow, God willing, if the Lord wills. And my regular time will be 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time, Canadian time. 5 to 6. That's the set schedule. Okay, God willing, un unless something happens. Okay. Now let's unpack Isaiah 49 and remind me to give you links to some articles, right? Isaiah 49. Does the New Testament show Jesus fulfills Isaiah 49? Okay, Isaiah 49 verse 2. You ready? Isaiah 49 verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. So notice, his mouth is like a sword that can kill you dead. His mouth is sharp so that when he passes judgment, it's like a sword that penetrates and kills you dead, right? His mouth, right? What does it say about the mouth of Jesus Christ? Revelation 1.16. Yeah, I saw that, Lopez. That's prophetic, man. Because I'm a shadow. You're a shadow. Reflecting the greater reality. And let me just comment on that real quickly. We are all shadows of Jesus because we are commanded scripture to imitate him, to mimic him, to conform to him and act like him, love like him, worship like him and serve like him. So we are all meant to be shadows of Christ. So praise the Lord. Revelation 1, 12. I don't know why you went. Uh, oh, yeah. 
Revelation 1.16, I'm sorry. Revelation 1.16, the servant's mouth is a sword that cuts you dead by his words, right? The servant's mouth is so powerful that his words are like a sword that cuts you dead, okay? What does it say about Jesus? Revelation 1.16, in his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Wow. Jesus has a metaphorical sword coming out of his mouth. What does it mean? He doesn't have a literal physical sword. This is a metaphor meaning that when Jesus passes judgment on you, if you're wicked, his word will cut you dead like a sword. You know how it says cut you like a knife? He cuts you like a sword if he passes judgment on you. And there's no power that can stop him. Right? So notice, like the servant, Jesus' mouth is likened to a sword. Revelation 2.12 and Revelation 2.16. Revelation 2 verse 12 and Revelation 2.16. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? Right. The words of him was the sharp two-edged sword. Revelation 2.16. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. I don't need a physical sword to kill you dead. All I do is say a word and I strike you dead because I'm all powerful. It's my word that's giving you life. It's my word that created all things. It's my word that's sustaining all things. And by this very word, I can take back that life and kill you dead and you can't do nothing about it. You see that in Revelation 2, 16, Jesus speaking in glory? If you don't repent, I will come against them with the sword of my mouth. You catching it? Revelation 19, 15. Why don't you go back to Israel and make Aliyah before I lay hands on you and send you back to Babylon? Get out of here. Revelation 19, 15. From his mouth come a sharp sword. Pay attention, everyone. It's a metaphorical sword. It's referring to his words. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Revelation 19, 21. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Okay, did you see the first connection with the servant of Isaiah 49? That individual called Israel. You see how it's Jesus? Like that servant, Jesus' mouth is like a sword. Did you make that first connection? Now, notice I said it's not a literal sword. It's metaphorical, right? It's referring to the words of his mouth, killing you dead, striking you dead just by his word. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 to prove that. How does Jesus kill the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then the lawless one will be, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth, the breath that it takes to form words, because if you put your hand by your mouth, you'll see that every time you, you form sentences, you breathe. He will kill the Antichrist by the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Wow. Look at how powerful Jesus is. That by his mouth, he can kill you dead. By his mouth, he can make you alive, and it's the words of his mouth that sustain all creation and gives life to all things because he's all-powerful. Now, let me give you another example. John 18, verses 4 to 6. John 18, verses 4 to 6. And this Jesus is real. He's alive. He is reality. He is life. He's in love, love with us. He is with us, and we will see him in his physical body, and we will dwell with him. John 18, verses 4 to 6. Read with me. John 18, verses 4 to 6. When they came to arrest him, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said, said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Ego I me. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Now notice verse 6, folks. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. 
just by the two words, ego, I, me, in, in Hebrew, anihu, those two words knocked them backwards to the ground. All he did was, I am, boom, they fell background from the power, the majesty, the sovereignty of the words of the God man. You know what he was showing them? Let me show you what he was saying. You cannot lay a finger on me if it wasn't my will to die because I have the power to wipe you out of existence because it's my words that are giving you life and sustaining you. And that same word can wipe you out of existence and leave you paralyzed. And there's nothing you can do by the word of his mouth. You catch it now? That's who this Jesus is. This Jesus that said those words, who walked this, this planet, who dwelt on this planet, whom people saw and beheld, that Jesus that you just read, who said those words in time and space about 2,000 years ago, he is now alive in heaven on the throne in his physical body that he raised immortal and indestructible he is that same Jesus who is using that same mouth and those same words to sustain this creation and give us life. That's who he is. Okay? So are you saying that as far as the New Testament is concerned, Jesus is that servant Israel in Isaiah 49? That was the first connection. Now I'm going to go a little faster. We won't need to spend too much time. You got that, right? The servant called Israel, that individual, his mouth is a sword, so is Jesus. Second connection, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 49, verse 8. Isaiah 49, verse 8. Amen, Nada. It's showing that he's in control of his destiny. He determines when he'll be arrested, by whom, and when he will die. Isaiah 49, verse 8. Pay attention, folks. Thus says Jehovah the Lord. In a time of favor, I have answered you, speaking to the servant. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. You will be a covenant to the people to establish land, to apportion to desolate heritage, heritages. Luke 22, 20. This servant is a covenant. We'll make a covenant with the people. Luke 22, verse 20. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? And likewise, the cup after that they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The second connection. Jesus, like that servant Israel, his mouth is, a, is like a sharpened sword. And Jesus, like that servant Israel, makes a covenant with the people. Third connection. Isaiah 49, 9 to 10. Isaiah 49, 9 to 10. Luis, are you saying I'm holding up your husband? I hope he's not getting upset. Isaiah 49, verses 9 to 10. We're almost done. Almost done. Saying to the prisoners, come out. To those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, and all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he, the servant, who has, who has pity on them, will lead them. By springs of water will guide them. So the servant will lead them to pastures, guide them to springs of water. Revelation 7, 15 to 16. The third connection with Jesus. Revelation 7, 15 to 16. And we're almost done right after this. We'll be done. Revelation 7, 15 to 16. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more. Sound familiar? That's Isaiah 49, verse 10. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. And then 17, before the rapture. Revelation 7, 15, 17, I said. I don't know why I stopped 16. I'll hurt you, brother. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. Wow, that's Isaiah 49, verse 10. The Lamb, Jesus, guides them to springs of living water. Exactly what the servant does in Isaiah 49. So Jesus, like the servant, guides his flock to living waters. 
Jesus, like the servant, is a covenant to the people. Jesus, like the servant, his mouth is a sharpened sword. Finally, and we're done. Finally, Isaiah 49, verses 5 to 6. Isaiah 49, verses 5 to 6. We're now done. Mary, were you here from the beginning listening to all this? Here, I will. Isaiah 49, 5 to 6. Final connection. And now Jehovah says he will form me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I'm honored in the eyes of Jehovah, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the, to the end of the earth. Now, here, let's finish it. Let's go out with a bang. First and last, do me the favor. Post, listen carefully, Luke 2, 28 to 32, Luke chapter 2, verses 28 to 32 with Isaiah 49, verse 6. Luke chapter 2, verses 28 to 32 with Isaiah 49, verse 6. And we're done. We're done. God willing, I'm also planning to do small segments, small videos, like 10, 15 minutes. God willing, I'm going to ask Protestant and first last to work with me how to do that, where we do also small sessions, you know, just like David Wood does, 15 minutes cl clips and live streams. Luke 2, 28 to 32. Pay attention, folks. Pay attention. Simeon, Simeon, this older servant of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, sees the baby Jesus in the arms of Mary. He picks up the baby Jesus. He took up, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Guys, pay attention. The language of Simeon, filled with the Holy Spirit, when he holds the baby Jesus in his arms, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. This baby Jesus in my arms, Lord, the Spirit told me I would see him before I died. And now filled with the Spirit, the Spirit told me he is here. That's him. And then he quotes Isaiah 49, verse 6. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Did you see what Simeon said? He alluded to Isaiah 49, 6. A light of revelation to the Gentiles, to the nations, to bring your salvation and the glory of Israel. That's Isaiah 49, Lord. And here he is in my arms. Here is your servant Israel of Isaiah 49. Here's the baby Jesus who's the Messiah, the servant Israel, the one you named Israel after the nation. Here he is in my arms. And now I'm ready to die in peace. Okay. Is there any doubt? God bless you too, TBL James. Is there any doubt Isaiah 49 is all about Jesus as far as the New Testament's concerned? Jesus fulfills all that Isaiah 49 said that servant called Israel would fulfill. Any doubt? We, we got to end it. Okay. But you understand what that means? That means one of the names of Jesus is Israel because that servant, Isaiah 49, he's one human male individual called Israel, and he saves the nation Israel. And the New Testament says Jesus is that Israel. So one of the names of Jesus is Israel. One of the names of Jesus is David. God willing, tomorrow, you're going to see why that's important. So folks, Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow between 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Canadian time. But here, let me give you the links to the articles. Answeringislam.net just posted some of my newest articles. So here's the link. Check them out and check out the articles by the other authors. And here, let me give you two more articles to read. I revamped an old article that had disappeared, but I was able to recover it. Jesus as a son of God, a biblical exegesis. So don't go anywhere. Let me get you these articles. Click on them, save them, study them, upload them to your websites and distribute them. And this one here. I also revamped this one. Jesus as the mighty God of Isaiah 9 verse 6. Jesus is the mighty God of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Is Jesus Yahweh in the flesh or one of many gods? So here's the, here's the other articles. Click on the links, save them, study them, upload them, distribute them for the glory of Jesus. 
Guys, do pray. My oldest daughter's birthday is coming up March 12. Another year I won't be with her and she was sad about it. Pray God does a miracle for her and for my baby girl and for me that God will bring them sooner than later. Live with me here to raise them. Guys, please, because her birthday's coming up. She's going to be 10. And this is now the second birthday that I won't be there. So I'm going to be doing a live stream, a YouTube where I'm going to be wishing her a happy birthday, telling her and her sister how much we love them. I'm going to do a live stream on her birthday, God willing, and send it to them. Pray for our miracle. Jesus, save me from that wicked judge. Keep them away. Bring my daughters to me. Keep all men away from them, guys. Please, God will hear your prayers for them. Pray, Lord Jesus, remove Martin, Simon, Yaku from their lives. Convict their mother, Michelle, to fear you and bow the knee to you and bring his daughters to him. They need their Baba, in their lives, not some unbeliever, wicked, agnostic, heretic, right? They don't need that. They need the man of God whom God made their earthly Baba. Please pray for that miracle. My daughters are hurting. Pray the Lord will convict their mother to repent and fear and bow before the feet of Jesus to come here she can start a life here. She doesn't need to be there for that man. He needs to go in Jesus' name. Because as long as he's, he's there, that's a Band-Aid. That's what she's using to cover up the deeper wounds, a Band-Aid, because she refuses to come to Jesus to be healed. And no Band-Aid will last. Her solution is not men. Her solution is Jesus. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. I love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Remember, Christ is alive. He can never die. He is almighty to save. It's by his word that he sustains all creation and gives us life. He's one with the Father and the Spirit. And we who love him will be with him. And we can never die because he can never die. We love you, Lord Jesus. Take care.